In our headlines on this Monday afternoon, July 11th, Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party secured a major victory in the upper house elections on Sunday. Pundits here are now pinning high hopes on enhanced Seoul-Tokyo ties. And South Korea's ministries are making their reports to President Yoon suk yeol starting on this Monday with the Finance and Economy Ministry touching upon the cost of living. Local power consumption during the first six months of this year hit a fresh high at 269,432 gigawatts amid increased industrial activities and earlier than expected heat waves. Japan's ruling party and its coalition partners secured significant victory in Sunday's upper house election. The victory itself offers Prime Minister Fumio Kishida the opportunity to govern without interruption until another scheduled election in the year 2025. Also, the latest political event follows the fatal shooting of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe while on the campaign trail last Friday. Kim Dami starts us off. Japan's ruling coalition secured a sweeping victory in Sunday's somber upper house election held in the shadow of the assassination of former conservative PM Shinzo Abe. The former leaders of the Liberal Democratic Party took 63 out of 125 seats contested, securing its majority with its junior partner Komito in the 248-member chamber. While the upper house election does not signify a change of government, it does effectively show public sentiment on the sitting government. Such a strong showing helps a Prime Minister Fumio Kishida consolidate his role and drive his party's key policies forward, including the push to revise Japan's constitution. In terms of foreign affairs, hopes are high that frosty South Korea-Japan relations, held back by historical disputes, may get back on track. But some experts are not too hopeful that Kishida's firmer control of the government will be a game-changer for the bilateral ties. If, if he really, he already won. A lower house election last October. So if he, if, so if he really wanted to push ahead, um, taking concrete measures to improve ties, he could have done that already. But with the launch of the new Yoon Sagar administration, South Korea has taken one step closer to Tokyo by rolling out a new joint consultative body over compensation for forced wartime labor. Now could be an appropriate time for the Gishida government to respond to SARS efforts. Some experts say. In order for the UN administration to smoothly persuade victims or seek their understanding, I think Prime Minister Kishida also needs his own cooperative attitude or guidance. Hurdles the dual lie ahead for Kishida, who may be walking on eggshells around his conservative Liberal Democratic Party when it comes to historical conflicts between South Korea and Japan. However, in the aftermath of Abe's assassination, Kishida may now look to put his more conciliatory and mediating hue to the fore. And that might mean there could be room for high-level talks on the sidelines of a visit by a South Korean delegation to a memorial service for Abe this week. South Korea and Japan are reportedly on the final stages of arranging a visit to Tokyo by SARS top diplomat Park Jin Too, with South Korea's foreign ministry hopeful that the meeting can take place. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Here on the local front, Foreign Minister Park Jin on this Monday paid his respects at a temporary altar set up by the Japanese embassy in Seoul in memory of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. At the embassy's public information and cultural center, Park signed a book of condolences in which he shared his prayers for Abe's family, friends and the people of Japan. President Yoon Sagyal is also scheduled to make his way to the memorial altar this week. South Korean ministries will make their reports to President Yoon suk yeol for the first time since the new administration took office in early May. Now, the presidential office says the ministries will start their briefings this week with the Ministry of Finance and Economy going first on this Monday. Now, high on the finance ministry's agenda is the cost of living. The reports will be made at the Yongsan presidential office and unlike in the past, the president is expected to hold one-on-one -on -one sessions with each minister. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy and the Ministries of SMEs and Startups are scheduled for Tuesday. The Bank of Korea meets on Wednesday this week and pundits believe yet another interest rate hike is inevitable amid efforts to curb inflation and to hold steady the foreign exchange market. Our Ideon reports. 
The Bank of Korea is likely to weigh heavily toward an interest rate hike of 50 basis points on Wednesday. At least, that's what analysts predict. The consumer price index rose 6 percent in June from a year earlier, accelerating at the fastest pace since November 1998. Inflation expectations hit the highest level in about 10 years in June, too, with people expecting consumer prices to rise 3.9 percent over the next year. That's the highest figure since April 2012. Considering the U.S. Fed's recent rates increase of 0.75 percentage points and the rising Korean won U.S. dollar exchange rate, experts say increasing by 25 basis points would not be enough to tame economic challenges. If Korea raises 25 basis points instead of 50 points, it could cause problems in the foreign exchange market like capital outflow as the U.S. already increased its rates by 75 basis points. In April, the Bank of Korea decided to raise rates by 25 basis points to 1.75. Then in May, it once again raised rates by 25 basis points. Should the Bank of Korea decide on another increase in the coming days, it will mark the first time ever that rates have been raised on three consecutive occasions. Some experts say this may lead to shrinking consumer confidence. Still, increasing household debts will remain as a big issue when considering the big step of raising rates by 50 basis points. Also, corporates could be in danger of bankruptcy due to high interest, which will bring a shrinking employment rate. Meanwhile, experts forecast the interest rates may reach 2.5 to 2.75 percent by the end of this year. The figure currently stands at 1.75 percent. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, power consumption here in South Korea hit a fresh high during the first six months of this year amid greater industrial activity and the early arrival of the blistering heat. Our Eun Jin has those figures. COVID-19-related social distancing and business operation restrictions have all been lifted. And as South Korea returns to normal, energy consumption in the industrial sector is showing record figures. Adding to the energy use is the scorching heat wave that's hit the country earlier than usual, with electricity usage in May and June higher than in any other month ever. According to KEPCO and the Korea Power Exchange, electricity consumption in the first six months came to 269,432 gigawatts, up 3.9 percent from the same period last year. It's not just the usage that's increased. Energy prices in South Korea have been impacted by rising global energy prices. The system marginal prices of energy surpassed the 15 cents per kilowatt mark for the first time this April, an increase of 165 percent from the same time last year. The country spent 28.7 billion U.S. dollars on electricity in the first half of the year, 60.7 percent higher than the same time last year, and breaking the $23 billion mark for the first time ever. Energy consumption is expected to break records in the second half of this year. The early heat wave has already pushed energy demand above the level seen in the summer of 2018, which was the hottest summer on record. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Also, the UN administration is set to hold its first meeting with the Infectious Disease Crisis Committee to hammer out response measures to tackle the latest COVID-19 resurgence. The virtual meeting is scheduled for this Monday evening at 7 p.m. local time. Now, on the agenda is the possible adjustment of quarantine requirements for COVID-19 patients, as well as countermeasures ahead of a potential rampant rebound in the weeks ahead. The committee is composed of some 20 experts from the health and economic sectors. Now, President Yun Sagyal has been stressing the need for science-based quarantine guidelines. That brings us to the end of part one of the Daily Report. In part two, we reassess ties between South Korea and neighboring Japan. Stay with us. Extraordinary climate crisis. A pledge to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. Protesters gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arika, what matters?
Welcome back. Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party secured a sweeping victory in Sunday's uprise election, which took place just days after the shocking, senseless shooting of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. In today's segment of Viewpoint, we revisit Seoul's ties with Tokyo amid these latest events. And for more on that, I have Professor Yi Hee on at Handong Global University. Professor Yi, welcome to the program. Thank you. I also have Professor Yoshihide Soyeya at Keio University live on the line. Professor Soyeya, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Right, Professor Soyeya, we'll start with you then. Let's begin with a few words on the results of Sunday's Upper House election. I understand the results were largely expected, Professor. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, I think it is. Uh, and uh, the LDP winning and its coalition partners, you know, winning jointly, I think that was pretty much expected. Um, but of course, uh, one the big factor was the assassination of former Prime Minister Abe shortly before the election day. And according to one, uh, uh, you know, sur survey done by one of the TV programs, 13% uh, reserved response to Seoul's efforts to boost bilateral ties to domestic politics, namely Sunday's upper house election. Now that it's over, do you expect a warmer stance perhaps from the Kishida administration to the UN administration's olive branch? Yes, uh, but as with most th most things related to Korea-Japan issues, uh, obviously it's very complicated. And particularly, I think the complications, I think, in this relationship with Prime Minister uh, Kishida and UN administration is particularly, I think, the domestic political considerations in Japan. Now, obviously, uh, before the election, I think there was some cooling of sort of the sort of the initial entreaties made by the UN administration to sort of warm up relations, particularly sort of in the aftermath of the the Moon administration, which was much cooler to uh, a, a better sort of forward-looking Japan-Korea relationship. But I think uh, Prime Minister Kishida, I think, with this election, obviously potentially has a more to gain, obviously with respect to 
holding his foothold within the party, but and giving more confidence to himself, and as well as to sort of lay out sort of his his priorities for this relationship. But I think the issue that Prime Minister Kashida will have to look at, of course, is with uh, Abe's assassination. Obviously, there are sort of elements within the LDP that want to sort of challenge Korea, and particularly on these some of these issues that Korea has had with Japan. And so, even though Kashida may want to forward this relationship, Kashida has to, of course, look to people within his party and also the domestic. Uh, consensus in terms of whether or not Japan should move forward in a positive looking relationship. And also you have to factor into the United States as well. The United States wants to have better relations between Korea and Japan. So I think all of these factors will take into consideration. But in the end, my expectation is that, that after this sort of slow dance between the two administrations, that there will be warmer ties. Right. And Professor Soeya, the UN administration for its part has launched an advisory uh, group consisting of government officials and civilian mm -hmm. experts charged with the task, of course, of finding a solution to the issue of wartime forced labor. Do you suppose such efforts will improve Seoul-Tokyo ties? Well, uh, it should be positive, of course. Uh, but uh, as uh, Professor Lee uh, implied, I think uh, the, the issue which is the, you know of importance first and foremost uh, is domestic politics on both sides and I think the start of this panel I think is first and foremost again it should be an issue of domestic you know uh, debates uh, within within Korea and uh, the case is the same back in Japan uh, you know how to respond to this sort of new initiative I think it, it's it's a you know huge uh, political issue uh, among you know different types of groups and uh, overall of course this is a good start but this, this sort of action itself, I think, is not uh, powerful enough to change the basic course of relations between the two countries over these very difficult, complex uh, so-called history issues. Right, I see. And staying with efforts then to find a settlement to historical matters, Professor E, the 12-member advisory committee includes two lawyers representing the forced uh, laborers. Could you tell us a bit about their demands? Well, simply, I mean, because they represent their own clients, uh, they want to have direct negotiation mm -hmm. with the companies involved. And so because they have a ruling in their favor here in Korea, basically their position is they want to collect compensation for their clients. And so in order to do that, they want to be able to have direct negotiations and work out some sort of compensation for their clients. But as we know, this is a complicated issue. This doesn't just involve, of course, just a local court case involving private parties, but this en encompasses Japan-Korea relations. And because this is such a, a hot-button political issue, not just within Korea, but as uh, Professor said, uh, in Japan as well, uh, this is has multi-dimensional levels that I think just beyond just the simple legal matter of just collecting compensation. So the lawyer's perspective really is simply to collect compensation and to extract as much as they can for their clients. But I think this is going to be more challenging. And I think the lawyers, of course, understand this. They know that it can't simply just get compensation from these Japanese companies. And so it'll be interesting to see what sort of pressure these lawyers and other civic groups within Korea may put on the government in terms of not backing down with respect to this particular claim of compensation. Right, and staying with the compensation mentioned by Professor E, Professor Soeya, among the proposals is one that calls on Korean firms that benefited from Japanese loans and grants under the 1965 treaty, like POSCO, to make initial contributions mm -hmm. to the compensation and then call on Japanese firms to take similar action. How feasible is this proposal, do you think? Well, uh I, 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 I remember that at one point some, some, some years ago that uh, POSCO uh, has been preparing to uh, put some reserves, I mean financial reserves, in order to deal with this sort of problem, which was uh, you know, largely expected. And, uh, and as, as you said, I mean, Shinitez helped POSCO. Uh, to come to this stage of, you know, kind of, you know, inter international and uh, cooperation, and the, 
Well, I once visited the you know Korean History Museum, modern uh, Republic of Korea History Museum near Kangwonmun, uh, and one thing which struck me was there was virtually no display or mention of Japan's help. South Korea modernize and you know, after diplomatic normalization. Uh, you know, I understand the emotions, but the fact of the matter is totally different. And the Sinites helped POSCO, I think, pretty much uh, in, in the course of Korean industrialization. And that company itself is now under fire because of the history problem. And as a Japanese, I feel a bit sorry about this sort of mismatch. But anyway, I mean, POSCO knows its history and Sinites knows its history. And this two companies working together I think is is a good thing essentially and it's up it's up to the government uh, you know whether or not they're going to intervene in this you know commercial sort of uh, ties uh, and uh, so before I mean the Abe administration was not very enthusiastic about this evolution of you know both companies working together but uh, I, I'm pretty sure Kishida has a somewhat different view on this even though whether he can carry this out is a, another issue but but so there is hope and for these companies to take initiatives but it, again it, it may go back to the question of domestic politics again yeah. right professor do you see Korean companies as taking on perhaps an active stance with regard to such contributions uh, I think it really depends on sort of who you're talking to because I, I, I understand the professor's comments a bit about the history of, the, of POSCO, of course, getting uh, assistance from Japan in terms of the, the treaty itself and, and some grants, of course, in the past. But I think the, the current considerations, I think if you're CEO of, of POSCO, you have to consider obviously what Koreans are thinking. And I think this becomes, I think, a particularly thorny issue with respect to contributions because I think the civic groups and the lawyers want to demand that the Japanese companies themselves uh, are the ones that pay out this compensation, not a Korean company, because Korean companies were not necessarily involved, of course, directly in forced labor. And so naturally, if you're a Korean company, you may think twice really about making contributions. But we don't know, of course, how the government's going to come down, right, on some of these issues and, and what pressure they may bring to bear on some of these companies to make these contributions. So I think it really remains to be seen about whether or not these companies will actually make these contributions in, in furtherance of Japan-Korea relations. Professor, speaking within your capacity as a scholar in the field of law, what are your thoughts on the potential solution, perhaps, to this ongoing dispute between the two countries? Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's going to be hard because obviously the question is really it's, it's a political issue. Uh, while, you know, on the legal end of things, you know, you can make a compromise, you can make a contract, an agreement, you can settle this, of course, as a matter of law. Uh, but because this is such a, a huge political issue, I mean, the complications are enormous. And I think the risks, of course, from both sides are very, very high. And so when it comes to forging in an arrangement, I mean, we've seen in the past that there have been sort of uh, settlements. I mean, in, you know, most famously in this country, the 2015 Comfort Women Agreement, which was hotly debated, hotly contested. And even though it was sort of a settlement, a settlement of sorts, uh, from a legal perspective, potentially, but the but the politics, of course, is, is going to play the biggest role in this. So whether or not a settlement is possible really depends on the politics of the time. Right. And moving forward then, Professor Soeya, some say Tokyo's possible removal of restrictions on key export items to Seoul may actually serve to put on track efforts to boost ties. That being said, what are the chances of such a move by Tokyo? Well, uh, logically and rationally speaking, uh, there should be no problem uh, on the part of the Japanese government to move in, in that direction. I mean, the issue was not necessarily putting restrictions, I mean, on export, but uh, removing South Korea from the so-called white country listing and which made processes of you know export uh, management very very complex but uh, as i know uh, i think the negative impacts of that those measures were almost gone at this 
uh, time, and largely because of South Korean self-efforts, but uh, sometimes because of, in some areas, because of nature of economic dealings. And uh, so remove and uh, putting South Korea back to the, you know, uh, white country listing, I think that that should be an, an issue. And uh, if dealt with, you know, properly, again, it's a political issue and uh, about economic dimension. And I think this is not impossible, but uh, again, it depends on politics. Right, and we'll keep our fingers crossed for that then. Professor E, the most recent accord between South Korea and Japan with regard to the painful plight of comfort women was reached in the year 2015. But some scholars say that that particular agreement was flawed from the start and that continued denials from the Japanese government undermine the spirit of that accord. Do you agree? Well, I think if you look at the actual agreement itself, the text, or at least not the text, but at least the statements that were made when both Prime Minister Kishida and Foreign Minister Yoon made their announcement of this deal, uh, that actually the Japanese government admitted that they were involved to some degree with respect to the plight of the uh, comfort women. And so I think there was some direct responsibility taken by the Japanese government and sort of in the issuance of an apology to some degree. But the problem, of course, I think in the Korean side is that there was really no domestic consensus on this question. And particularly, you know, the, the input of the comfort women themselves was never really addressed. And so this becomes, I think, the, the real question is the flaw in the agreement is insofar as it didn't take the victim's approach or at least the victim-centered approach on this question, at least get their input and get their buy-in in terms of accepting this deal. But this is a government-to-government -government matter, and so the question now becomes is, is there the political will and also the, the potential uh, the risks here for, for particularly the UN administration to push forward with this agreement and to accept it as final between the two sides? And so I think that is really the question that is going to be remaining with respect to this question and, naturally, uh, on the Japanese side, how they will continue to uphold their own responsibility for what happened during that time. Right. Professor Soya, as my foreign ministry correspondents have pointed out, uh, Prime Minister Han Dok-su is likely to attend the funeral of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe this week, which quite a few believe, of course, that it's the least that a neighboring country can do to comfort a traumatized Japan and convey its condolences. Now, that being said, how does the untimely passing of Mr. Abe look to affect Japan and its future policies? Well, uh, for the time being, uh, th this particular point will be the biggest, will continue to be the biggest factor uh, in sort of looking at uh, how Kishida administration will control not only domestic politics, but uh, diplomacy, including uh, Japan-South Korea relations. And uh, the conventional wisdom before the election, and, the, and particularly before the passing of uh, former Prime Minister Abe, uh, was Kishida will gradually, you know, step by step, try to sort of redress the unbalance uh, of Japanese approach uh, toward particularly Northeast Asia. And uh, and I think that, that, that fundamental sort of uh, uh, drive is there, uh, but the passing of Prime Minister Abe made it more complicated. At least for a short while, I think Kishida will have to be very careful about, you know, moving away from the legacies of the Abe period, which in effect would mean more sort of influence of this factor, uh, Abe factor upon Kishida for, for the for for, for some time to come. Uh, it may sound somewhat contradictory, but uh, I think that's going to be the reality. So I think from South Korean point of view, I think it is particularly important to appreciate this sort of paradox in the short term. But uh, over the long term, I, I would expect things would, would come back to according to Kishida's sort of uh, design and wishes. And, uh, some elements of which we're thinking, but, uh, but if, you know, we control politics well on both sides, I think that's not entirely impossible. Right. And do you share these positive outlook, uh, this very cautious positive outlook that is, Professor E, very briefly speaking? Yeah, yeah, Professor Soya, I think, I, with Professor Soya's points, I think, are, are on point. I think there will be trust-building measures that will be taken by both sides, the UN administration and Kashida, to sort of build their trust between them. But naturally, these historical matters are going to pop up 
uh, from time to time and really how each country manages their domestic circles with respect to these issues will be very, very important. And I think the last thing to mention here is, you know, what Kushida will do with respect to its now his new majority now in terms of consolidating his authority within the LDP. Will they go forward now and revise the peace constitution? I think that's the, that's the X factor here and how neighboring countries, particularly with South Korea, will, will then react in that eventuality. Right. All right, Professor E, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And Professor Suyo, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Welcome. In Ukraine, Russia's brutal offensive against civilian infrastructure continues and the latest targeted an apartment building that killed at least 15 people. Our Kim Yo-san has details. Russian rockets have hit a five-story apartment block in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region. Local authorities said the strike took place on Saturday evening in the town of Chesiu Yar. Residents recall the deadly moments. I spent the whole night in the street. I ran after the hit and stayed on the street. I thought it would hit again, and in the end, it hit three times. I couldn't stay inside. After the first hit, we ran through the corridor. During the second hit, we were running towards the door. We ran on glass shards. Then we ran to the basement as the third explosion happened. Following the attack, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's chief of staff said in a telegram post that the strike was, quote, another terrorist attack and that Moscow should be designated as a state sponsor of terrorism. Nevertheless, Russia, which says it's conducting a, quote, special military operation to demilitarize Ukraine, denies deliberately attacking civilians. Against his backdrop, a total of 347 Ukrainian children have been killed while over 600 others have been injured as of July 10th since the start of Moscow's full-scale invasion in February. That's according to data released by the Ukrainian Prosecutor General's office, which also emphasized that the figures are not final as efforts are ongoing to establish casualties in areas of active hostilities. Kim Hyesan, Arirang News. Back here in South Korea, Foreign Minister Park Jin has reiterated the UN administration's resolve to restore Seoul's ties with Tokyo. Speaking to reporters on Monday, Park said the two countries, that is, are engaged in talks to fine-tune his planned visit to Japan, adding that the trip will take place at a mutually convenient time. Park also underscored that Seoul will seek to pursue a future-oriented approach to ties with Japan, one that is based on shared values and interests. With regard to South Korea's attendance at former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's funeral, he reaffirmed plans to dispatch a delegation once Tokyo announces the official schedule. Efforts to facilitate the assimilation of North Korean defectors into the South Korean society is a challenging initiative, and the facility in charge of that task has pledged to do more to ensure broader employment opportunities. Han Song reports. The doors to a completely new life in South Korea after fleeing the Kim regime. Located around 80 kilometers south of Seoul in Anseong, Gyeonggi-do province, is the Hanawon Settlement Support Center for North Korean refugees. Managed by the Ministry of Unification, the facility is staffed with experts who, for three months, help defectors both socially and culturally acclimate themselves to South Korea's capitalist democracy. The defectors have access to medical care and various forms of job training, including computer lessons at the resettlement center, while their children can begin a proper South Korean education. Friday was its 23rd opening anniversary ceremony, and among dignitaries present for the event were ruling People Power Party lawmakers Kim Ha-kyung and Ji Sung-ho, a Hanawon graduate himself, as well as the Minister of Unification, Kwon young se In his commemorative speech, Kwon called North Korean defectors precursors to unification and stressed how important it is for the government to make life in South Korea easier for them. 
So far, around 30,000 defectors have taken the courageous first step into South Korean society through this place, the Hanawon. Moving forward, we must nurture more and more people from North Korea, not just Mr. Xi, into respected South Korean leaders, like Angela Merkel from East Germany and the United States' Barack Obama, whose father was a foreigner, became in their own countries. Prior to the ceremony, a unification ministry official acknowledged that much remains to be done. Career diversity among Hanawon graduates is not ideal, with many working simple jobs in the service sector. Their turnover rate is reportedly quite high as well, an issue the South Korean government will have to address with a long-term plan moving forward. Han sung Arirang News. Global shortages in the supply of cooking oil have prompted one local firm to seek better use of rapeseed here in the country as a viable alternative. Our Cho Song Min explains. Rapeseeds are one of the most prevalent kinds of flowers that bloom in South Korea at this time of year. While they're mostly enjoyed as part of beautiful landscapes, one local company claims it's found a new way to use them in the kitchen. The factory produces up to 20 tons of cooking oil from the seeds each day. It's currently being used to cook lunches at local elementary schools, but will be on the shelves in supermarkets in July. Since homegrown rapeseed oil is now being produced, there's less of a price gap with canola oil. We're hoping to see a boost in consumption of local rapeseed oil. Containing omega-6 and 9 fatty acids, rapeseed oil is rich in antioxidants and can prevent aging and obesity. Compared to canola and olive oils, which are 100% imported, Rapeseed oil contains less saturated fat and, according to experts, is better to cook with. Making salad dressing with rapeseed oil gives it much more flavor. It's also great for making stir-fried or pan-fried dishes. As rapeseed flowers can be planted alongside other crops on the same land, local farms can rake in more profits. We are researching ways to develop rapeseed species that contain high-quality oil and show high yields, and also to expand ways to harvest the flowers. South Korea's agriculture agencies hope to expand the culinary uses of rapeseed oil and secure a safe option to deal with a potential supply shortage of cooking oils. Cho Song Min, Arirang News. Being on a diet appears to be a growing trend here on the local front, regardless of one's weight, and health experts are linking this phenomenon to social media. My colleague Shin Yoon has this coverage. It's summer, which means it's time to get into shape. Here in Korea, many people are trying to lose weight to take something called a body profile shoot. This is when people take professional pictures of themselves at their fittest, like Chihi, who's been preparing for her shoot for six months. This has been on my bucket list for a long time. I wanted to have a record of when I'm at my most young and fit. So back in January, I started looking for studios, but they were all booked up, so I had to wait until June. The amount of money people have to spend on photos, gym fees, and personal trainers also pushes people to work out. It all adds up to more than 2 million won, or around 1,550 U.S. dollars. While many are satisfied with the final results, they often also say they never want to do it again. Though rewarding, this process was hard. There were so many times I couldn't eat out with my friends because of my strict diet. I hardly touched anything made with flour or too much oil. Behind the perfect bodies are also many side effects related to health. It's definitely not a healthy way to lose weight because you're trying to do it in an extremely short amount of time. Some women see irregular menstruation cycles and hair loss. Sudden and vigorous exercise also harms your joints. While many people are aware that losing a significant amount of weight in a short amount of time does more harm than good, it's still something they aspire to do. That's because dieting has become the norm in Korea. Studies show one out of two South Koreans are always on a diet. I came to the streets to find out if this is true. 우리나라가 되게 다이어트를 하는 사람이 굉장히 많은데 왜 그렇게들 한다고 생각을 하는지 일단 주변에서 하니까 나도 어쩔 수 없이 해야 되는 그런 이미지도 있고요. 연예인들 보면은 옷도 너무 예쁘게 입고 그래가지고 아 나도 저렇게 되고 싶다라는 생각에 다이어트를 하는 것 같아요. 그냥 살이 찌면 스트레스 받아서 다이어트. 
아 너무 사람들이 빡빡하게 사는 것 같아요. 그만 좀 빼고 살았으면 좋겠어요. 말랐는데 뭘 자꾸 또 빼려해요. When asked why, 10 out of 10 said they didn't like the way they looked or they thought they were overweight. This shocked some tourists. My first impression, oh my god, everybody's like so skinny. Um, because in Germany there are like more people who like have more weight on their body. And can you believe that most of the Koreans out there are always on a diet? Always? Really? One out of two Koreans are always on a diet thinking that they're not skinny enough. What do you think about that? Okay, that's crazy. Um, there's, I don't know why it is like this, maybe social pressure also. And I think what I'm like, I think like being beautiful and like skinny is like kind of like important here, I think. Uh, but that I feel very sorry because it's not good like for your mind and like also like, not good for your body to like be always on a diet. South Korea has one of the lowest obesity rates in the OECD, even with a lower body mass index required to be classed as overweight. While countries like the U.S. consider those with a BMI of 25 and up to be overweight, Korea classes being overweight as having a BMI of 23 or higher. I talked to a psychology professor about why dieting has become the norm in a country with one of the lowest obesity rates. He said it's because of group mentality especially in a homogenous country like Korea, when people inevitably compare themselves with one another. This has become more severe with more people active on social media. Everyone looks super skinny and beautiful on social media. They also happen to be smiling, which makes us subconsciously think that in order to be happy, we need to lose more weight. Also, users only get to know each other through pictures and videos. They inevitably have to judge people's personalities by their looks. So our mind thinks that the skinnier our social media friend is, the more diligent they are. Recognizing that this isn't healthy, there's been a desire for change. A diverse range of sizes and plus-size models have hit Korea. Ko Eun-byar has been working as a plus-size model for two years. She too used to go to the extremes to lose weight, but after seeing her mental health and body break down, she realized she needed to stop. We shouldn't stress out and try to squeeze ourselves into society's perfect weight and body size. You don't need to lose weight if you're healthy, and you definitely shouldn't do it for beauty purposes. I'm not encouraging obesity. I'm saying it's okay to be a bit overweight because everyone is beautiful just the way they are. Many health professionals agreed that not everyone should be on a diet. Even those who are should be doing it for their own health. Here in Korea, people tend to think they are overweight when they are not. But medically speaking, dieting is recommended for people who are extremely overweight or obese. It shouldn't be solely for beauty purposes. It's to prevent illnesses and be healthy. As a psychologist, I can confidently say trying to eat less and going on a strict diet is very difficult and stressful. It goes against some of the nature. No wonder there's a concept known as comfort food. Humans are happy when they eat. If you're going to be stressed going on a diet, it's better not to do it at all. Whether it's for one's own satisfaction or for their own health, people who are trying to lose weight should do so healthily. But I have so many questions, like how? Starting with food. Should I only be eating salad? Or can I have some carbs? Definitely. At least 20% what you eat in a day should be carbs, because our brain needs them to produce energy. But make sure to have a balanced diet with all five of the main nutrients. To lose weight, it's important to have smaller portions. The number of calories a body requires is only 30 times its weight. For instance, if you're 60 kilograms, you can have up to 1,800 calories per day. But to lose weight, you should have 500 calories less than that. While working out, a question popped up in my head. I know cardio is really effective for losing weight, but doesn't vigorous exercise like this wear down on my knees? Walking up the stairs is much more effective than running on a straight surface in terms of exercise and for your knees because you use up to five times your own weight, which also helps develop your muscular strength. The orthopedist said taking care of your joints is crucial when exercising, as once our cartilage is damaged, it can never fully recover. On the internet, many people have been seeing drastic results even after eating all the snacks they want. 
thanks to diet pills. So I was wondering, is it okay for anyone to try diet pills? Even me? This is a tricky question. In the bigger picture, yes. Diet pills help you lose weight because they activate bowel movements and affect your appetite. But if you aren't obese and haven't received medical prescriptions, you shouldn't try them out at all. There could be serious side effects. Lastly, I'm sweating so much right now, but does this mean I'm actually losing weight? No, sweat is simply waste and water coming out of our bodies. Temporarily, sweating a lot may bring down your body weight, but once you drink water, it will go straight back up. This endocrinologist recommended that we not only do cardio, but also muscle strengthening exercises, and for at least 50 minutes a day. More importantly than having a perfect body is just having fun and being happy while exercising and eating healthily, like me right now. News, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In South Africa, shootings over the weekend at township bars have left at least 21 dead. There have been three shootings in total, with the most recent one killing at least 15 people at a bar in Soweto. Local authorities said the incident occurred just after midnight on Sunday local time. They said a group of men armed with rifles and 9mm pistols started shooting randomly at the patrons of a bar in the Nomzamo shantytown near Johannesburg. Reports say that 23 people were shot and 12 died at scene, while at least three more died at hospital. Just a few hours earlier on Saturday in Pietermaritzburg, some 500 kilometers away, another shooting left four dead and eight injured. And Friday, in Katlehong Township near Johannesburg, four people entered a bar and used a single gun, killing two people and injuring four. In all three shootings, the suspects fled the scene and are still at large. Officials believe the shootings are not linked, adding the number of gunmen in the first two incidents has not been determined and the motives for all three shootings are still being investigated. Protesters in Sri Lanka have occupied the president's residence, his seaside office and the prime minister's home. They have vowed to remain until the leader's resignations are official. The parliament speaker announced on Saturday that President Gotabaya Rajapaksa will step down on July 13th, but there has been no statement from the president himself. This comes as thousands of protesters gathered in the capital Colombo on Saturday. Sri Lanka has seen months of protests as it is suffering food, fuel and medicine shortages amid its worst economic crisis since gaining independence. Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe also announced his resignation after his house was set alight during Saturday's protests. Protesters, however, remain skeptical about the leader's commitment to leave office. Tesla CEO Elon Musk could be forced to see through his 44 billion US dollar takeover of Twitter or to pay a 1 billion dollar penalty. This follows the billionaire's announcement on Friday that he's pulling the plug on the deal, citing his ongoing concerns over the number of Twitter's spam bot accounts. Responding to the move, Twitter have reportedly assembled a legal team to sue Musk. Twitter's chairman Brett Taylor tweeted that the company intends to, quote, pursue legal action to enforce the merger agreement. Novak Djokovic once again managed to find success on Wimbledon turf, claiming his fourth straight men's single Wimbledon title and his 21st Grand Slam title overall. The Serbian tennis player beat Australian Nick Kyrgios on Sunday in the final match of the tournament. Kyrgios got off to a strong start, winning the first set before Djokovic fought his way back. Djokovic has previously won in 2018, 2019 and 2021, while the 2020 tournament was cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, in the women's singles final on Saturday, Elena Rybakina became the first player from Kazakhstan to win a Grand Slam title and the youngest to do so since 2011. She beat Tunisian Ons Jabur. Born in Moscow, Rybakina changed her citizenship in 2018 after receiving financial support from Kazakhstan. Her victory comes at a time where Russian nationals are banned from participating in many major sporting events, including Wimbledon. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News.
Good Monday afternoon. Well, yesterday, Seoul was baking in peak summer heat, topping off at 35 degrees. But temperatures will come down to 30 degrees with nationwide rain in the forecast. Well, this time, the rain will be centered in southern regions and Jeju Islands. So those regions might see intense and powerful rain. And the rain will mostly die out in the evening, but will continue in some regions until tomorrow. So Jeollanamdo province and south coast are seeing up to 80 millimeters of rain, with between 5 to 60 millimeters for other regions. And now that the monsoon has kicked in again, all heat advisories across the country have been lifted. So most regions are hovering at 30 degrees. But don't get settled too much as the temperature is about to soar again when the rain fades away. And there's a chance of heat alerts being issued centered in western regions. Well, tomorrow showers are in the forecast for southern regions and then a spell of prolonged round of rain on and off until later this week. Now let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions. Those are the headlines at this hour. Do stay tuned for more of the day's top stories. Thank you for now. See you same time on Tuesday.